Welcome to another episode of Pitch with Pete. I'm super excited to be joined by Yasemin with Maza. They bring magic to every bite with their line of sauces and dips that are Middle Eastern inspired. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her to tell us the whole story. Hi, my name is Yasmin Sajadi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Maza. We make a line of sauces and dips that brings magic to every bite. Why settle for boring, bland, and uninspired when you can eat like this? Maza adds a flavor burst that transforms any meal into something one of a kind. Our story began when my parents arrived here from Afghanistan. I'm one of 55 cousins, so we have a really big family who gets together almost every weekend, and the focus is all about the food. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen and around the dinner table. At that table, the star of every meal was our mom, cilantro, and ginger chutney. Realizing we couldn't keep this magical sauce to ourselves, my sister and I founded Maza, meaning flavor in Farsi. We started by making 25 tiny jars at a time, selling at our local farmer's market. We soon discovered a growing community of saucy superfans who kept coming back for more. The great the great thing about our mom's magic sauce is it's versatile and easy to use. Made with all fresh ingredients, you can dip, spread, or drizzle. And this is not just for Indian takeout. You can throw it on a fish taco, a charcuterie board, or anything off the grill. In January 2020, I was in the last semester of my MBA and used Maza as my case study. I thought, you know what? This chutney thing could actually work. So I quit my job to focus on the business full time. And by the end of the year, we were featured in the New York Times. From there, things took off faster than we could have imagined. We knew we were onto something big and had to learn quickly. So we did different accelerator programs, asked for help wherever we could, and then like struck twice as Maza was selected from over a thousand brands to join the Kroger Fresh and Local program. Kroger was searching for the best, most innovative products in America, and we maximized this opportunity learning how to get our product on the shelf and off the shelf from America's leading grocer. Meanwhile, we showed up big in the industry. Our debut at Expo West was a mic drop moment. We won the Expo West pitch competition, and major outlets featured us front and center declaring global food as the next trend. And the market keeps proving this out. We've seen this with major exits from Cholula, Rouse, and are positioning Mazad to be next. Millennials, we don't have spice racks. We have condiment shelves. Dips and sauces are an easy, low-risk way for consumers to expand their palate. And America is obsessed with condiments. It's a $29 billion industry. Refrigerated sauces and dips is the hottest area of the store with 91% growth. And the market is ready. 75% of consumers want to explore Middle Eastern cuisine. Middle Eastern dishes are trending on restaurant menus. And the global food category and grocery is on track to reach $15 trillion by 2030. Our vision is to boldly rediscover, re imagine and rebrand Middle Eastern food. Let's move from dusty and dated to fresh and fabulous. And this is already happening. The ongoing media buzz has propelled us into the spotlight. Alongside my sister and co-founder Sheila and our mom, we are proudly leading the way in the industry, sharing our story and creating meaningful impact in the world of food. Sauces and dips are just the beginning. Maza is a platform to share our vibrant flavors with America, expanding into sides and entrees to satisfy appetites of our consumers and retail partners. Leveraging what we learned from Kroger, we've set the stage to maximize opportunity to grow with major channel partners. We're launching in 300 Target stores in January, secured our first Whole Foods region and our first Costco rotation. Our goal is to become the category leader with a balanced velocity, ACV, and innovation by working with key partners to prove out our hero products and not just open doors. With our planned distribution in 2024, we'll be approaching 2 million by the end of the year. And we're not doing this alone. We're backed by a team of A-list experts from sales, finance, and operations. Your contribution to our non-dilutive community fund will fuel our next stage of growth. And we know our success is not just for us. Maza is a family-owned business of Afghan women, and we see a bright future for Maza and chose the Malala Fund as our partner to make sure the future is bright for other girls and women just like us. We believe we can make a difference well beyond the dinner table. Join Maza and together we'll bring magic to every bite. Awesome. Thank you. I love it. I'm like really hungry now. <laughs> so I, I need I need to try these sauces. I tried to look up and I uh, couldn't find any in Utah. Talk to me a little bit more about what your geographic expansion looks like, uh, particularly these partnerships with Whole Foods, Costco, Target. Like Those sound super exciting. We're based in the Twin Cities. We sell in our local region in the co-op in our natural chains here. With our Kroger launch, we launched here in the Midwest. We're also in Texas. We have a little bit of distribution in Southern California. Our Target launch will be uh, all the Midwest uh, and Southern California. 
Whole Foods will be Midwest lunch, and our Costco rotation is Northern California. How many doors does that represent? It will represent close to about 800 doors, and then we'll be adding another few hundred next year. That's great. So you have about 800 doors today, or you'll be adding 100 new doors? So we're moving from about 70 doors to mid-year, about 500 doors next year, and then another 500. So it's like 70 to 1,000 doors next year. Got it. So today you're at about 75 doors, sprinkled, mostly in the Midwest, sprinkled in a few other cities. And then this will take you to a thousand doors by the end of next year. Yep. Yeah, that's super exciting. What were the buyers most excited about in terms of the product? Yeah, I think our story is really authentic. I think the branding is really beautiful and bold. I think the flavors from Afghanistan and just representing this part of the world is also missing from the shelves. So I think when folks try our products for the first time, uh, they're just amazed with how flavorful they are, how fresh tasting they are. Our products are refrigerated, so it's refrigerated condiments, apple cider vinegar and lemon juice base, so it's very vibrant tasting. And we use all raw ingredients so it packs it's full of flavor and i think a lot of the way consumers are shopping is they're looking for fresh convenient flavors they're looking for clean label they're looking for you know new flavor profiles from other places in the world so we hit a lot of these things that are trending in grocery right now last year um we won a spot in the kroger fresh and local program and that was truly how we spent the last 18 months was building our supply chain commercializing our products we spent a lot of time figuring out the difference between good cilantro and bad cilantro uh, we worked with a volunteer group at General Mills to help us identify all of our SOPs, all of our QA documents, everything that we needed to go look and find different co-packers across the country. So right now we produce in Utah uh, for this next stage of growth. We're adding a co-manufacturer here in the Midwest because a lot of our supply chain, you, you know, you want to have multiple distribution points for your products. Right now we're on the shelf for $8.99. So our product is a premium product. People are willing to spend more on products that taste good, that feel good, that they know that there's not a lot of crap in it. And also just being able to support an authentic, real brand where you trust that the makers are going to represent the culture in a way or the food from Afghanistan in a, in a real, authentic way. Um, I think consumers can sniff out in authenticity, right? Like, I think they know that this brand of refried beans that's 99 cents is completely different than the one that's 6.99, right? Like, I think people can kind of see that now and are willing to pay more. Our distribution margins, we go direct to a few of our retailers. Um, so our margins are between 45 and 90% before trade and after 25 to 30%. When we distribute with a partner like UNFI or K here, our margins sit between 36 and 40% before trade and after trade, 60 to 20%. 20% of trade of gross revenue goes back to in-store promotions. So we do a lot of promos around the holidays, Thanksgiving, Easter, and Christmas are like the biggest food shopping times of the year. The Super Bowl is another big one. We try to keep, because we're an emerging brand, it's on the higher end, but we have to spend our money and we try to keep it close, close to the product, close to the customer. Talk to me about gross margins. Where are they today and where do you anticipate them coming out in the future? This year we'll end at 38% margin. Our wholesale is 455. Uh, we sell for 282. In January, our product margin will be at 218. And by the end of the year with our planned retail launches, we'll be closer to a 57% margin. Yo, who do you view as your, as your main competition? There's not a ton of chutneys on the market right now. There's a brand called Patox that has a, like a spicy mango chutney. Um, it's shelf stable. It's pretty sweet. Um, it doesn't taste as like fruit forward or has a like a little, it's a little more dense than our cardamom mango chutney is. Other than that, there's not a ton of other chutneys on the market. I think if you are in the global foods aisle, you'll maybe find one or two versions of that style of chutney. Um, as far as like refrigerated condiments and sauces go, uh, there's a brand called Haven's Kitchen that's more of like a, like a meal prep type of sauce. Other products are like bold and packed full of flavor like 
kimchi or a fermented refrigerated sriracha or um, sauerkraut. Yeah, I love that. I think sriracha is like such a good example of that where it's kind of this unique uh, flavor profile as a condiment, right? That you could just get like chili powder, um, but it's so much easier to just grab the sriracha bottle, right? And has caused like a lot of people to to become massive fans and and maybe even a little addicted to it, right? As we saw when or earlier today when when there was that big sh or earlier this year when there was that big shortage. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I'd love to talk about kind of traction. So where do you think you'll end up from a revenue perspective this year? Where does all of these new retail doors take you to next year? This year will be ending the year in 150,000. Um, next year with the re with the planned retail launches will be closer to $1.8 million. When people first meet us, they're like, oh, wow, you're in Kroger. I expect that we're in like 2,000 doors. But it's, it's, tr it's truly like an accelerator program to like get your <laughs> together and build your supply chain and then understand what it truly takes to like manage a national <laughs> retail partner like that. And for us to be able to like compete in the space, uh, you have to go out and raise money. And you can't just like spend 50 grand on marketing with one retailer. You have to like engage multiple retailers and make the spend worth it. What other thing, is there anything else that you would want uh, people to know as they're considering investing in your company? We have a unique product offering, but we're also a very authentic brand owners and brand founders where we've been bringing this product to our local farmers market translating it to mass retail we have caught the attention of major retailers that are falling in love with the brand story falling in love with the product and really giving us a shot at connecting with our customers people that value good food people that value diversity, people that value, you know, uh, bringing new product to market, supporting emerging brands. I think this is, this is for them. Awesome. I love it. Well, yes, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you for walking us through your company and the opportunity. For those of you that are interested in learning more, be sure to go check out their WeFunder page. You can find that at wefunder.com slash mazah. Uh, that's spelled M-A-A-Z-A-H. And uh, there's a lot of great content on there you can dive into and uh, also send in some Q&A questions to Yasemin and her team. Uh, thank you so much for joining and um, we wish you the very best of success with your uh, fundraising campaign. Thank you. All right, wasn't Yasemin and Maza super interesting? Uh, she has so much great energy. I really enjoyed my conversation with her. I don't know what it is about women that are launching food products, but they are like so fun to talk to. You want to see another good example of that? Check out the Painterland Sisters video that I shot a few weeks ago. Fantastic people. Anyways, I want to touch on five of the things that I really liked about her pitch and four of the things that I think are some risks that you need to be comfortable with if you decide to invest. So let's dive in. First of all, love the early traction. I think it's fantastic that she is getting this early traction with some very large customers and being able to get into a lot of these big name brand companies like Costco. I think that's going to do a tremendous amount for her in terms of allowing her to build a brand to grow really fast. It also adds a certain level of credibility to what they're doing and is the kind of thing that's really hard to be able to achieve this early on in their process. Uh, there does come some risk on that and I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. The next thing I really love is that she is effectively, her and her sister are effectively creating a new category, right? So there are products out there for Mexican food. There's products out there for Indian food. There's not a lot of products that I've seen in the grocery store, at least for uh, Middle Eastern food. And so I think that is like this big opportunity to come in and essentially establish a brand as a brand new category. That demographic is a very large one in the US. It's growing very quickly. And not only that, but lots of people love Middle Eastern food. Like I said in the video, the number one restaurant in Utah right now, at least on Yelp from a ratings perspective, is Afghan Kitchen, which just goes back to show that people are really interested in this type of cuisine. I think there's this really interesting opportunity for them to come in and establish this brand new category, and especially the dominant brand in the space and on grocery store shelves. 
Speaking of branding, I think the branding, the packaging, the messaging, the graphics, the user experience, like all of those things looks incredible with this package. I wish that I had some in hand that I could actually see in real life, but all of the stuff I've seen online, the videos, the pictures of the packagings and the product, uh, all look phenomenal. And I think will allow them to really stand out on the shelf and among you know a lot of these other ethnic products, if you will, for lack of a better word, that are on the shelves that don't have that same pop and brand that Za really brings to the table. I also really like the founders. Uh, I think Yasemin is great. Uh, she clearly has like a good operations background and then her sister really brings the creative side and I think that's like a really interesting combination between the two. I mean her sister has all this experience doing product at Target which feels like it's got really good alignment in terms of who their target demographic is and should be and how to design products that really mesh for that target demographic. And then Yasemin brings kind of this, this operational know-how, right? Getting things done, checking boxes, making sure they're compliant, making sure like, you know, the bus runs on time basically. Uh, and I think that's a great combination. Lastly, I feel like RBF is the right model here. You look at companies like Chubani, right? Fantastic brand, huge growth, very profitable, still private. And so if you were an early investor in Chubani, Unless they're doing dividend payouts, like you're still just like sitting on on paper gains, and uh, that can be really challenging if you know you want to eventually exit out of your investment once you've been holding it for a long time. So RBF is interesting. Our, for those that you don't know, RBF stands for revenue based financing, and basically what happens is they pay a percentage of revenues to their investors every month or every quarter, uh, kind of depend or every year, kind of depends uh, on what period that they set forth. And the beauty of this is that if they have a really good month, they pay out a lot. If they have a really bad month, they pay out a lot less. And so it's able to fluctuate with the business up and down rather than, you know, a, a fixed payment that has to go out the door every single month. And so if you have a bad month, that could be, you know, really challenging. And then if you have a good month, you don't get any credit for it because you're just making this fixed payment. Uh, so RBF, I think, is really interesting here. In this particular case, it's about 2%. And, uh, you know, with that, let's talk about some of the cons. And I think that 2% is something that you need to be careful with, or at least understand what's going on here. So if we take their projections at face value and say that like, okay, they are going to hit those numbers, which I would say probably like less than 5% of companies actually hit plan. Uh, so not to say that they won't, but there's some risk there that they might not. But let's say they do hit plan, your payback period if they raise half a million dollars is roughly three years before they're, they're gonna pay you back. And then that fourth year, assuming that they really hit that like hockey stick curve of $27 million, that's when you'll be able to double your money, which is the cap on the RBF, right? So it's 2% so of revenue up to a cap of 2X. That ends up netting out to about a 19% IRR, uh, which the way to think about that is RBF is kind of like a loan. So it's kind of like you're making 19% interest on that loan to the company, um, which is pretty good. Like 19% interest is pretty good. But you know, look, there is some risk that the company could go out of business. It's not entirely clear if you'd have first right to the assets. So anyways, that's just something that you need to be thinking about is like, if you're modeling out that everything goes perfectly, you're gonna get about a 19% return. If you're happy with that, if that fits with uh, your investment criteria, then this could make a lot of sense to move forward with. If it doesn't match with your investment criteria, it's something that you you need to, to understand. The next risk I want to talk about is the team. So I think Yasemin and her sister are fantastic. I want and I love like all the advisors they have around the table. I think they've I think they've definitely like knocked it out of the park and swinging above their weight when it comes to amazing mentors around them. But I would love to see a little bit more fleshed out around the rest of their team, like people that actually have experience uh, that are in the business day out, day in day out that have sold to these types of companies that have managed the, these types of relationships because that brings me to my next concern which is look food is hard and in this particular case you're selling a food that it has to be kept cold so you have cold supply chain issues right like i mean you got to keep that product cold so it doesn't go bad and it's more likely to go bad sooner. So like you have all this like cold storage, cold supply chain issue that you're dealing with and you're dealing with, you know, relatively low margins. Although, you know, I think there is good room for margin improvement as they scale. So I think that's good. But as she mentioned on the call, they're going to have to reinvest a lot of that margin back into marketing to really build the brand, uh, which is the right strategy. It's just that when your margins are that tight, it doesn't give you a lot of room for error. If something happens to the supply chain, it could put 
them out of business very quickly, for example. So you just need to be comfortable with that risk. It's kind of offset by the size of the market here, which I think is very, very big. There is kind of a counterpoint to that, which is like, yes, we have some supply chain risk, but this is a very known supply chain risk and supply chain issue. There are a lot of companies that face this. There's some very good standard protocols that you can use. The flip side is the market is really big. And so, you know, kind of helps offset that. The last thing that's really tied to that though is this working capital need. And this is probably like one of the bigger risks that I see in this business is that yes, it's awesome that they're launching with so many great partners, retail partners and getting into so many doors so quickly. That does represent a big working capital uh, risk though because what oftentimes will happen is companies will start scaling a little too quickly, right? They get into these, these large retailers, retailers demand a lot from these companies. They basically say, you guys have to provide all the working capital here. You guys have to take all the risk. Uh, if it takes off, that's great. Then you need to find more money to support that growth, right? Because we're not going to provide it. And if things don't go well, then all of a sudden, like those retailers are like pushing product back to you and doing all kinds of things that can make it really expensive. So if you talk to a lot of investors that have experience investing in consumer products companies, they'll get very weary about expanding too aggressively with large retail accounts before the business has the cash balance, the stability, the outside network of customers to really support big fluctuations because growing a little too fast, too quickly with some of these retailers can cause real issues for a company and in many cases have put companies out of business because they like grow so fast they can't support the working capital needs and collapse the cash deficit needs of the business. Anyways, tell me what you think. As always, this is not investment advice, should not be construed as such. These are just some of the things that I'm thinking about, the things that I like, the risks that I see. Tell me down in the comments, what are the risks that you see? What are the merits of the deal? And if you end up investing, please let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear kind of your investment thesis as you went ahead and made that investment. And if you've enjoyed this, be sure to check out some of my other WeFunder videos where I met with some incredible founders like Renuka at Clockwork. Thanks.